everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. With me is Father Jerry Blaschak, who is our alumni chaplain and special assistant to the president. And we are both so thrilled to welcome our special guest this evening, Father Kevin O'Brien. Father O'Brien is the Vice Provost and Executive Director of Fairfield's Bellarmine Campus, which I personally will say has been a really truly inspiring program to witness this year throughout the first year of its operation. And I know you all wanna hear from him soon and hear more about Fairfield Bellarmine. So I'll just quickly go over a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll get started. First, I ask that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the conversation just to minimize any background noise or distractions. And second, I recommend that you use speaker view in Zoom rather than gallery view, just to keep the focus of your screen on our speakers. And finally, if you have any questions that come up during the discussion, please feel free to submit them to me through the chat. And if we do have time at the end, I'll try to get to as many of them as we can. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry. Thanks very much, very much, Jessica. Um, many of you who have been following our series since the, uh, I think the spring of 2020, uh, know that we began during COVID and the intention was to continue to find you through this technology, a way to stay in touch with our alumni community and friends of the university and wider, uh, wider, wider friends uh, who are interested in Fairfield's Jesuit Catholic tradition. Uh, Rather than do something abstract, you know, fish out topics about Ignatian spirituality or the lives of Jesuit saints, we decided that uh, a, a, a powerful way and maybe an evocative way of getting us all to uh, reflect on what makes Ignatian spirituality so powerful and so effective would be actually to speak to Jesuits who, uh, who, who incorporate and who illustrate this gift that St. Ignatius has given to the whole church. And, uh, and so we've been doing that in the last few years, and we expanded it this year to include stories of our alumni as well. Uh, tonight, I'm very, very, very pleased to be able uh, to, to speak with Father Kevin O'Brien. Father Kevin O'Brien uh, is uh, the author of two very important books. We'll talk about those later, and I suspect that some of you are here uh, because you met Kevin first through his works. Kevin, welcome to Fairfield and welcome to uh, this conversation with our larger community. Thanks, Jerry. Kevin, how long um, exactly have you been here at Fairfield? I came two years ago. So this is, I'm going to start my third year. One year was, you know, basically preparing for the launch of Bellarmine, hiring people and renovating. And then uh, this last year has been our first year of operation. So it's great to be here. And it's great having this conversation with you, Jerry. Just so everyone knows, Jerry literally was the first Jesuit I met when I joined the Jesuits. I, I you pull it, the novitiate is the first two years of our, of our Jesuit life. It's basically a, you know, a, a seminary of sorts. Um, and we pull up to, uh, my dad and I pulled up to the house in Syracuse and there was Jerry standing in the driveway. <laughs> and so uh, that was the beginning of, of a really wonderful friendship over the years. So it's great to be with you, Jerry. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Kevin, how is it, uh, you know, I, I now, I, you know, Kevin was blown my cover, so uh, I can't pretend not to know lots of things about Kevin, most of which uh, are not germane to our conversation. But I do know, for example, that Kevin was not born in the United States, that Kevin, uh, right. Kevin, Kevin knows all about uh, crossing borders. And uh, we'll say later in, the, in our conversation that he has a special passion and concern for people who cross and live across borders. But Kevin, you're out from our northern border, correct? Yes, Montreal. So I was born on the English side of Montreal. Um, and I just spent four years of my life there. Um, I, Jerry, I remember sitting in the novitiate in the house and it was fall and a bunch of geese landed on our front lawn. And you say, Kevin, your relatives have arrived. Um, <laughs> So uh, my family, though, moved down to South Florida, quite a dramatic change um, in the in the around 1970. My dad was in the golf business and his work took him down down to South Florida. Um, uh, and that's where I grew up. But Kevin, we have no Jesuits. Well, not any any long. Well, we have Jesuits in Miami. The the Cuban Jesuits were there with a the high school and a retreat house and um but yeah. English speaking Jesuits uh, have no presence in South we, Florida. So how did, how did you meet the Jesuits? Jerry, as you know, well, you're I think in Palm you, Beach anyway. Your family's yeah, Palm Beach. In, 
in Northern Palm, in Palm Beach County, the Jesuits founded the diocese and there was a Jesuit parish there during my years. I just never had any contact with it. I didn't meet any Jesuit. And it, it, since it, that parish is no longer in Jesuit hands, but no, I had no, I had no contact with the Jesuits until high school. Uh, well, not even high school, but the nun who was the guidance counselor in my Catholic school says, Kevin, you know, she knew I liked politics and everything. And, <clears throat> And I, she says, Kevin, you should think about going to Georgetown. I go, why? She goes, well, it's a Jesuit university. And I go, I don't. What is a Jesuit? And she tried to explain to me. And then she goes, and they have they have a large number of Jesuit vocations from Georgetown, which was not really a selling a selling <laughs> point. But my Irish twin brother went to Notre Dame, and I headed off to Georgetown. And that's where I met the Jesuits, and and that's where really, um, you know, I I I love meeting them as a professors or as uh, people who lived on the corridor or the dorm, you know, I just, I was attracted to their, their, um, their down to earth spirituality, their engagement, meeting people where they're at commitment to justice, um, commitment to teaching and the intellectual life. So I, I, I made some good friends. And so I remember thinking about joining the Jesuits in the, in college, but my interest was simply a function of my esteem for those men and nothing really personal. Uh, I really wasn't praying. I, I went to church and, you know, thought about faith and struggled with it, but it, there was nothing deeply personal. Uh, so I went to law school after thinking of, of, a, of a career in law. But So what happened between being attracted by those Jesuits and the quality of their lives? And when I first met you on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the driveway of St. Andrew Hall in Syracuse, what moved you from admiration of these men to a sense that you yourself would like to uh, follow this vocation? Well, it was in my mid-20s where I really, um, I was practicing law uh, uh, and I was interested in a career in, in in politics and government service. And so I was sort of climbing, so a little bit a little bit like Ignatius, sort of climbing the ladder. And I, I just, a few things happened in my, my mid-20s as can happen when you're young. I just said like, is this what I really wanted? Does this make me happy? I was really pursuing these things with some mixed ambition. I mean, I did want to serve and get back, but there was a lot of unhealthy ego attached to it as well. But in the end, I just really wasn't, I remember my best friend told me, she had known me since the second grade saying, you don't really seem happy, which by the way, is something no one likes to hear. <laughs> and I, of course said, of course I'm happy. And uh, and that, that question just sunk in and it was like, oh, there's something deeper. And so I finally stepped back and got serious about developing a prayer life found out what a spiritual director is. So got involved in spiritual direction where I really got serious. I remember jumping, you know, running into, I was very task oriented as a lawyer is and, um, and going to meet this Irish nun who was at a retreat center near, near my home. And, and I said, Oh, it's nice to meet you. So I want to, I want to figure out whether I'm called to be a Jesuit or not. And she just looked at me and laughed. <laughs> she goes, well, Kevin, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And I was, I, I had, I, I, I had no words. And so we spent a year on that question, basically. And it was really in the course of the spiritual direction, more serious focus on prayer. I left my law practice and started to teach at a local Catholic high school. So developing a real active spirituality, that's when my vocation came alive. Um, and I remember being with the students in high school thinking, gosh, I would love, I love this work. I love teaching. I was in my 20s. It's a great time to teach high school. But I said, I want to be with them, not simply as a teacher, but as a priest. And, and that's when I went back to the Jesuits. So, so as, as a lot of our, a lot of our uh, listeners on, know the first stage of the Jesuit formation, which is so very long, is the novitiate. Um, and that is the time that I had the privilege of accompanying you. When you look back at the novitiate, Kevin, I think for you and for so many people, uh, there were pivotal moments uh, in those first two years, probably ones that uh, um, that continue to shape you and continue to, yeah. you know, to manifest themselves in the choices you've made. Can you look back and were, were there were there such moments in your novitiate? Yeah, and that's why, and I I I shared them in in the Ignatian adventure uh, with some of you. This is uh, this is uh, basically a book. Uh, of the spiritual exercises, sort of my adaptation of them. And I share some of those stories um, as a way of inviting readers and people making the retreat to 
bring their own life narrative into the narrative of the Gospels and Ignatius's own life. And and as I reflect back, I mean, I wrote that ten year, ten plus years ago. But I mean, the the, the memories of the novitiate were strong still. Working in a cancer hospital, a palliative cancer hospital in the Bronx, <clears throat> some of the patients there. Um, working in Southwest Baltimore with a nun who lived in a very destitute area. Um, and then, of course, making the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius in the 30-day form. Um, that, of course, was most powerful. Um, and over the years, I made them, you know, Jesuits make that long retreat th two times in our lives. So I made it again, I don't know, 15 years later. Um, uh, but through it all, Jerry, I think that's why I just, the exercise is so transformative. And I would, you know, I, I, I learned how to direct them um, with with proper training, and I, I've directed the thirty day retreat, but I found my sort of my niche in directing the retreat in daily life over eight or nine months, uh, the so called nineteenth annotation retreat, and that's where I focus a lot of my attention because I think Jerry, as you know, you've directed a lot of those. Is you know the the amount of good that can be that is done through the the spiritual exercises, uh, the fruit it just unfolds and expands widely. So that's been a Beginning that first 30-day retreat in the cold days of January and the shores of Gloucester, um, from that moment, they've been defining for me. Kevin, what led you to uh, to finally decide to uh, to put together your the, the book, the the Ignatian Adventure? Um, you know, which, as far as I know, is used so widely now as yeah. as a manual for folks who are directing or accompanying those making the the 19th annotation retreat how'd you come how did you come to uh you know to finally I, decide to to work on the to, to put it into a book form yeah as you do jerry over the years when you give retreats you take notes and you collect stuff and so i just i like you probably i just had this big folder of stuff and different books and i you know i was i was mentored and trained by a, a few different people and I, I typed up some notes and would give them out. And a number of people just kept saying, you should, can you put this in a better, easily more readable format? Have you thought about putting this into a book? And I said, no, 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 no. But then finally I, I said, well, let me try it. And Loyola Press was interested. And so, um, I, so over the course of five years on nights and weekends, I was able to put it together while I was, uh, in formation and teaching theology, uh, studying theology in Boston, but then later as a, par a parish priest right after I was ordained. And and I, as I would give the, re the, the retreat, I would fine tune it sort of like Ignatius did when he would give, when he would have spiritual conversation with people and he would fine tune the exercises himself. I, I fine tuned that book over five years. And then over the last 10 years, I got so much feedback from people who have used it, I've, I'm, we're going to do a second edition this summer with some of that feedback. Again, the exercises are never set in stone. They're, they're, they're meant to be lived, not, you know, you can't read, you can't read this book like, or, or Ignatius's exercises, if it were a, a spiritual tome, it's like a cookbook. Um, uh, and the, the, the inspiration comes from acting on a living, living the exercises that, that, and, and um, praying through them. And that's where they come to life. So, I've gotten some wonderful feedback over the last 10 or so years, enough for a second edition. People who really gave me, you know, uh, you know, good critique, like try this, more voice. So there's more voices of women in this second edition. So I, I keep learning different insights into scripture. Yeah, and one of the things that, uh, that I've admired about your work over the years is that not only uh, through your experience and reflection, have you developed a tremendous versatility uh, mm -hmm. And capacity to uh, to give the exercises in the, in the form of the nineteenth annotation, but uh, you've seen uh, Ignatian spirituality uh, as an inspiration uh, for so many other ministries, and you've seen it uh, as your own personal, uh, you know, almost uh, uh, interpretive framework. Uh, I'm thinking about the work that you did uh, in the in the uh, in, in the border. Uh, mm -hmm. with uh with with uh, the board the uh, the migrants and refugees with the Jesuit yeah. refugee service yeah um, that was that was a major a major um... major yeah and it's something I had not experienced and this is the joy of Jesuit formation you're asked to do stuff you never would think of doing and the in the, the the presumption is it's not it's 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 usually correct most of the time though not yeah. always is you know our superiors get a sense of what you might need not just simply what you want 
And, and I just didn't, I didn't know. And I was asked to go cover for a Jesuit who was chaplain at an immigration detention center in LA. And it was a transformative summer. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm an immigrant, but I, I came from the Northern border, which is completely different than crossing the Southern border. And um, so I looked at it from that perspective, but it was walking with migrants and refugees in that detention center that was transformative. So much so that when I went off, you know, with Jesuits were this mix of, you know, study, work, study, work, study, work. And so I was working full time. And then I was sent to study theology, which is a hard adjustment. And uh, though I love theology, I miss the work. So I, I, I wrote my thesis, my graduate thesis on the Jesuit refugee service and a theology of accompaniment, which is really informed a lot. That theology is formed. It's basically a liberation theology from from Latin America, Jesu Jesuits and others that I really, it's uh, that's informed how I preach and how I think about the world. Um, you know, and the great lesson for me there is, you know, what we see depends on where we stand. And so the question is, where do we stand and with whom? And that, 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 those questions have been defining. It took me a while to, to actually name that as the question, but after all my study and of all the times in the border, I just, I realized what you see depends on where you stand. So the question is, where do we stand and where do I stand with whom? So when I went to Georgetown after, um, so I was ordained, did a couple of years at that parish in DC, which I love being a parish priest. You just, you just do everything um, at a parish would. Um, I went into Georgetown where I, I was in campus ministry and then was vice president for mission there and largely administrative role. So every place I've been sent I've always taught because I think it's important to be grounded in the work of a university, just not, you know, it's functioning. Um, I, I, you know, with a student, I started a trip to the border, uh, to the Kino Border Initiative, which is this wonderful border experience in Arizona and the Nogales, uh, Nogales Arizona and Nogales, Mexico. I, I believe Fairfield has sent folks down there. And I, I, gosh, I guess I've been down there six or seven times. And then I spent a summer down there again when I was older and I just, I, it, it, Jerry just has always given me perspective. And I think I've translated that into higher ed. I, you know, at Georgetown, at Santa Clara, and now at Fairfield, my, I, I love all of our students, but my, my heart really is, um, my heart uh, often is with our first generation and undocumented students. Mm -hmm. um, not in an exclusive way, but there's a, there's a, a pull that I have there. And I think that is completely informed by, um, by my work on the border and not just, not just like being there, but doing all that work in graduate school where I'm thinking about it and I'm praying about it. It's it, it just, it's been liberating for me. So Bellarmine, Bellarmine is a really a beautiful fit, Kevin, Absolutely. for your interests, your passions, your experiences. Kevin, yeah. not everybody on the call, uh, may understand what we're doing at Bellarmine. Uh, can I ask you to say a little bit about how yeah. Bellarmine got started and and where it is now and where well, you Jerry, see it I mean, going? you you could you can answer that better than I with getting started because you know you and others uh, like uh, Bob Hannafin, who I believe is on this call, Nikki Latang, PJ Lucky, I'm sure other folks were convened by Mark Nemec in the midst of the pandemic, I believe, mm -hmm. to consider do we want to open up a a two year associate's degree program or community college. Uh, at on the East Coast, particularly uh, here at Fairfield. And uh, this is uh, following the lead of Loyola University in Chicago, which opened up a similar college called Arupe College with great success. So I believe you you all spent, what, 12 or 18 months sort of looking through this, so working with the board. The board, of, um, the board of trustees was very helpful in shaping it. Mm -hmm. And it was approved by the board. And then six months later, they asked me to come on board to help, you know, you know, just help realize all the good work that had been all the good thinking and planning that had been done. So we spent a, I spent a year on a, with a, trying to just hire people. And then, uh, and then this year we're, we're up, we're up and running with our students. So it's the whole goal there. And it speaks, you're right, to tie it to my own personal I should say right before I came to Fairfield, I was on sabbatical and I was finishing um, my second book called Seeing with the Heart, which was, uh, a, it, was uh, it was integrated for me. A lot of the stuff I'm sharing with you now, I was able to integrate on 
during that year of sabbatical, um, writing alone every day, you do a lot of thinking, struggling, wrestling with God, relishing grace. And I came out of that year of sabbatical, which felt like a very, you know, a, just another retreat experience saying, I, my heart, I want to work, I want to be, I want to be devoted to first generation college students or undocumented students or those, those who don't have access or work with the Jesuit refugee service. So my provincial and I were discerning JRS or, and then this opportunity came along. So I'm grateful that Mark gave me this uh, chance to help out because it speaks to my heart. And um, so we're up and running in Bridgeport. And the whole point is to expand access and affordability to Jesuit higher education. And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of good people on this call who are associated with Bellarmine and who are supporting our efforts. And I, I know a number of you are, are not Fairfield. Um, we're not Fairfield connected until this project because you too believe that we need to access, we need to expand access to Catholic higher ed. And Jerry, this is, a, you know, you know higher ed very well, given all your years in higher ed and on boards and administration and teaching. You know, we're successful. All of our schools are 27 Jesuit universities and, you know, the 100 or, I don't know, 100 or so maybe Catholic universities. Like we're all very successful. The problem is we're victims of our own success. Our schools are hard to get into and they're very expensive. So in a sense, we're we're sort of not serving in as great numbers as we ought to. The very people, most of our colleges were founded to serve, mm -hmm. you know, immigrant, working, poor laborers. Um, and so Bellarmine, Fairfield Bellarmine is an opportunity to say, okay, let's go back to our roots and um, say, okay, let's, let's expand access. And we're doing that in our four-year program, you know, with programs like the Company Scholars, which is such a great program, but but we're doing this in a very, very concrete way, in a deeply committed way at Bellarmine. And all of our students are uh, from lower income backgrounds. Um, almost all of them are, are first generation. Um, and we're sitting in Bridgeport on a formerly, a former Catholic parish that the bishop who has been instrumental in launching this, um, you know, gave us and we renovated and it's a wonderful place. I encourage you all to visit. How are you recruiting students, Kevin? Yeah, we have deep, you know, this is being, this is why being part of Fairfield University is so helpful. We have deep connections to, we're not a, we're a commuter school. We're not, we don't have residences there. And, um, you know, we're deeply, our admissions team uh, deeply connected to um, every high school in the region. And so what we've done is we've, we've, you know, we just shared that with guidance counselors one at a time. And, you know, I was on, I remember being on a call during our planning year or, or a launch year before we were actually opened up the doors, sort of getting, getting students, like we had no students, we had no faculty, no staff. So it was really remarkable. It, it's like a startup. It's like an aunt in my years in California really helped, help me appreciate like, okay, we talk about entrepreneurship, like with businesses, like you can do that with higher ed too. In fact, Jesuits have been doing that for 500 years. The fact that Jesuits have schools in the first place is, a, is an entrepreneurial choice that Ignatius made. So we're doing it still. And, um, you know, we, we, we just did that work of planning. And I remember, you know, meeting with guidance counselors. And we, we, we remember, this is what we told them. We said, listen, our goal here is to expand access. And our, our students will, will graduate with little or no depth. And this one guidance counselor who had been a guidance counselor for like 30 years, she just started to weep. And we all paused. It was, it was a Zoom call. And we all paused and soaked that in. And she says, I never thought I would hear that. Wow. Wow. And, um, and we're true to it. Our students will, will, will graduate literal or no debt. Um, a thousand dollars is what we're asking families to contribute, and we know that that's nowhere near what it costs. But we, you know, we want to empower our families to contribute. Not everyone can do that. The rest comes from federal and state grants, uh, which is about half of our budget, and and another half is uh, is 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 philanthropy. So we're very grateful to all of our donors, some of some of whom are on this call. Kevin, how did how did you all decide that you would be in Bridgeport because the uh, 
Yeah, you, why didn't you just bring the the, the present Bellarmine students and integrate them into the uh, the, the Bellarmine? Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, our campus, the main campus here. Yeah, that's a great question, Jerry. And I know you were also part of those conversations. It was really a discernment about what mm -hmm. you know. We had there were two discernments which I think were critical um, for us. So one was on when we were trying to recruit students, like. I was scared as hell, frankly, because it was like, okay, we've now invested in all these renovations. We're hiring all these people. And I was going like, good Lord, are students going to come? And and I remember sitting with our team then, you know, um, at the time, Anissa and Nakia and PJ, we we're uh, Melissa Kwan, who was so a wonderful partner in this. We sat around and, and we had to make a choice because we were getting applicants who were not lower income. And... It was so tempting. These are all good kids who want to, but we just said, no, this is not our mission. Our mission is to provide access to people who could not get any, could not get access another way and make it affordable for, for kids for whom there's no other way for them to get a, a Jesuit Catholic education. So we discerned at that moment, we are sticking, we are committed to it. And students came, thank God. Um, and attracted because we are, we are crystal clear in our mission. And Jerry, that, that, that's been really instructive for us is like, just be focused on the mission because people really, really, it resonates. Um, and the other choice was Br Bridgeport or on the Benson Road campus. And, you know, there was a lot of great input we received. A lot of people said, you know, please know on, on, on the Fairfield campus, we would love to have interactions with our students and faculty. They'll be closer in proximity and all good reasons. Um, but in the end, the primary consideration for Bridgeport was um, we asked the people of Bridgeport. We, in other words, we had focus groups of community partners and churches and others. And they said, we want you in Bridgeport. Everyone's leaving Bridgeport, right? The last hotel just closed in Bridgeport last year, Jerry. That Holiday Inn on Main Street is closed. And um, we want you here close to where your students and your families live. So we said, okay. And there were two very practical considerations, Jerry. The other one, the first of those practical considerations was it is very difficult to get to this campus on public transportation. Right, right. And secondly, um, the bishop, who's a great partner in this, was offering us uh, a very favorable long-term lease on this, this property that was a former Catholic parish that had closed 10 years ago. In this this Paris St. Ambrose sits right up from Bridgeport Hospital. It sits on the highest point of Bridge, Bridgeport, and it's it was vacant for ten years. And he wanted. He said, "No, the, he's Bishop Cajon is deeply committed to to expanding um, Catholic education for his students, not you know from the Catholic schools, but others in the area." And um, and so he he offered us this property that we renovated. So those are the three reasons, both two practical and one just mission based. What kind of renovations did you have to do? Because the parish had been had been decommissioned for quite some while, right? Oh yeah, um, Jer, I mean, I think you and I walked through it early on. I mean, the, 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 it's a gigantic. And Jerry, I forget what what, what eth ethnic group worshipped in that parish back in the twenties. I think it was largely Irish Americans, uh, Kevin. Okay, so Saint Ambrose Parish. So in the nineteen twenties, this huge brick church. I don't know they probably crammed a thousand people in there on Sunday. Um, all the pews were there. Um, and uh, the convent was abandoned. So it was really in disrepair. The, there was this garage. So I think I called it a rat trap the first, I, the first I think, time I saw it and said, there's only one future for this place. It's to be torn down. But, yes, I, but, yes, but David and Frasinelli and the people who have worked with us proved me wrong. They did. Uh, Katie Hurley and David and others, just incredible. <clears throat> Um, so we converted the church into a classroom building, and it's honestly, I, I could describe it, but there's you just won't get it until you see it. We preserved every feature we could of a church and put a cla five classrooms in the building. Also remarkable is we took the three-car garage and made it into a science lab, which is frankly the best lab at the university. <laughs> we took the rat trap, also known as the former <laughs> convent of the sisters of, uh, I think they were um, IHMs, Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, they, uh, they, they had left a long time ago. So it was just a, no, ugh. uh, and we convert that to faculty, staff offices, student living space. And then there's a, the old rectories where my office and some administrative, creative office, administrative offices are. 
there's a wonderful, there's a Catholic school, a typical Catholic grade school right across the, the street there on Mill Hill Avenue. And um, it's currently occupied by a charter school, but they're going to be leaving at the end of their lease. So um, our expectation is that we will, uh, we, the university, will, will also take that building and renovate it for use by the university. So we call it a holy hill because it was sanctified, you know, over the years by the indigenous people of this region and then by this Catholic parish. Um, and you think about the, I, I just, every time I walk into the, the, the thousands of baptisms and weddings and funerals that took place in that parish for a hundred years. And then here we come and turn it into a Catholic school. It's just, it's holy ground. And we all treat it that way. I mean, everyone on the staff, our faculty and staff get the mission. They're deeply committed. That's how we hire there. And they are, and again, this is not proselytizing. There's no litmus test for hiring. There's none of that. But all of us have a deep commitment. We realize that this is holy ground that we're on because of what we're trying to do and who we're serving. And not just our students, but our families. I mean, they're deeply engaged. I mean, Jerry, you know this working, you know, um, in Bridgeport yourself, uh, a couple of parishes over the years that you, like, a student just doesn't come, their whole family comes uh, among our student population. Um, and it's delightful. Uh, let me tell you, Jerry, there's a story I, I'll, I'll never forget. We, so we, we, we opened, we finished the renovations three days before school started on that campus after Labor Day last year. And on the Friday before, we brought our students. Uh, at the time, there were 44 of them. So our, eventually, we'll get up to 200, but our first class of 44. And I love each of those 44 kids because all those students and their families came to us without any school, without any, well, without any teachers, without any students, without any buildings. And they came on our word and on the promise of the mission. And uh, we, I will always love them and be grateful for them for doing that, those 44. So we brought them on campus, showed them around before school officially started. And we walk into the, the what was the church is now this unbelievable classroom building. And the sanctuary is now this, this beautiful study hall with these towering ceilings and stained glass windows and this gold leaf ceiling. And there were gasps. And young one, young one, one of our students, a young woman, turns to me and sort of said, Father, is this for us? Almost like she couldn't believe it. And I said, you know, it is. And this is what you deserve. And I've always remembered that because it's like everything we do there, those kids deserve it. Um, and they work for it. Um, there's no sense of entitlement there. They're working, they're working at it and for it. You know, we've lost only two students since we arrived, and and um, we're still trying to care for those students. They they left for various reasons, but you know, over the course of of the year, we've only lost two students, for which we're very grateful. The average graduation rate in the state of Connecticut is seventeen percent for community from community colleges, colleges from two year colleges. Seventeen percent, and in the region, New York, New Jersey, it's 29 percent. So, our goal is is. Uh, much, much, much higher, 75%. Kevin, what about the curriculum? Is it a different curriculum than uh, what these students would encounter if they were on the North Benson campus? No, and that's why we're, you know, we strove for equity, you know, that basically this is a Fairfield University education. So their first year is the typical Magis core, the Jesuit core, the humanities and the sciences. So, you know, they're, they're, they're getting the core. And then um, the second year is basically uh, they, they track in either liberal studies or more that is more core, or they track in business, computer science, engineering, or health studies, pre-nursing. Um, and so then they're set up to trans to to matriculate to move into the four-year program program at Fairfield, or we're creating pathways to other universities. So we have an agreement with Albertus Magnus in New Haven, a Catholic Dominican school who has a great nursing criminal justice program too. We just announced a program with um uh, Williams College, the oldest and number one liberal arts college in the country, and we have a pathway to Williams. Um, and Fairfield has committed, the university has committed to funding 35 of our students fully. Um, wait, wait, 30, 35 30, students would receive a full scholarship. Wow. To fair, during their third and fourth year at Fairfield, if they if they get in. So, um, so if they matriculate, if they continue to matriculate at Fairfield, um, the board is committed to 35 
fully funded scholarships a year, which is a third of our class, basically. So it's really incredible. Now, what's the difference then in the way uh, the way the instruction takes place? What what's the experience of a Bellarmine student? How is it different than uh, yeah. the experience of of, of, a, of a student on the North Benson campus? Well, I'd like to say no difference and and then real difference. I mean, no difference in that, you know, the classrooms look like any university classroom. In fact, they're all new. They're beautiful. Um, uh, the, the, the curriculum is essentially the same. Um, some professors are fully dedicated to Bellarmine. Others you know, split their time to two classes at in Bridgeport, two classes on Benson Road, for instance. Um, we, we The only difference is we add 15 minutes per class, and that's been shown to be extremely helpful in uh in success so we're, we're basing our what we're doing there on, on solid research so 15 we added 15 minutes per class which helps our, our program is basically you know 11 10 11 months a year they take two courses in the summer four in the fall four in the spring in order to accommodate their work schedule most of our students are working full uh, part time to support their families um so we acknowledge that as well, uh, that reality. And so we provide food. Uh, we have, a, you know, we we subsidize lunches, so they make sure they get a meal. Um, we have, you know, mental health counselors, access to social workers for our families. So we're really we're we're looking at the the spectrum of supports for our students. If there's internet access issues at home, T-Mobile is a partner in providing uh, wireless access. We have we have an iPad program to give our students iPads with all their books. And software, so we're there's lots of we we you know the, these are known as support services. We say we're surrounding them with love so that no one slips through the cracks. Wow, 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 Kevin, it was a very bold thing for uh, Dr. Nemec and the Board of Trustees to do in the very beginning, because I mean when this was all being socialized with the board and when properties were being looked at and yeah. curricula were, were being designed, where in the world? I mean. <laughs> Financially, the university. It, this is an enormous commitment. Yes. Uh, how how has the, what are what have the what is the what have the how has the funding been going? Do you have some corporate sponsors? We, Do you have individuals we, who have stepped up? Yeah, uh, we we've we've had some lead gifts, uh, both corporate foundations and then individuals. Um, we're grateful, and and you know we're expanding the pool because. We are we are asking people who are not just simply at Fairfield uh, alumni or parents, but also essentially alums of other Catholic universities to to be a part of this innovative initiative. So that's what Anissa Demadio, who's our development director, who's so creative and and dedicated to what we're doing. Herself a first gen student, you know, she and I and you and Dr. Nemec go around the country. She, this isn't easy. Honestly, it's the easiest story to tell, Jerry and. I think you know if, if when our commitment shows and and we now we have our students who are telling their stories, people want to join. Hey, and honestly, if anyone's on this call, you want to be part of it, um, reach out to Jerry or me, uh, and we're you can you can join our family if you want to contribute. Um, uh, it's just a, a real wide network of of donors, which we're really delighted by. But we have a lot of work to do because I mean, half of our our budget is based on um, philanthropy, so it's it's expensive. And the board dedicated money from, you know, its reserves to say, okay, this is it's a mission based decision. And so mission based decisions are can be costly, but they the board is the board and Dr. Nemec made a really great commitment, and the fruits will expand widely. I I'm confident, and particularly let me just say the benefit to there's a the principal benefit for the university as a whole for those of you who are alums. For parents, it's like this is a, a a deep commitment to Bridgeport. You know, as Jerry knows, we Jesuits when we landed here in the 1940s intended to be in Bridgeport. That's where our school was going to be, and then the property, you know, in the in what's now the town of Fairfield became available. Uh, I don't, was that a estate or was it a foreclosure or something, Jerry? I forget. Yeah, foreclosures. Two foreclosures. two contiguous estates were up for back taxes. So there we go. So we we leaped, but we left Bridgeport. Now we've been connected to Bridgeport. Our faculty do research there. We have people living there, of course. Um, uh, we have the Center for Social Impact. And everything that Melissa Kwan has been doing with her oh, center. Yeah. But but listen, uh, but we're there. I mean, we have this imprint of land on the highest point of Bridgeport, and so Jerry, that's where, you know, it, and this is gonna this is gonna 
change us as a university to the better, to be rooted in a place like Bridgeport, a city that needs us and that we need as well. We have a lot to learn from the good people of Bridgeport. Um, because, you know, Benson Road's beautiful, but it can be a bit of a bubble. It, it's easy. I live on this campus in, in uh, on Benson Road, and it, it's tempting just to stay in this beautiful, you know, um, uh, campus. But it, this is not the real world, and we prepare our students to engage the real world. So um, our campus really, and so one of the great challenges we face is sort of bridging. It's about six miles apart. Doesn't doesn't take long to get there, but really bridging the gap is our main a main concern of ours in the years ahead. Kevin, you know that I could uh, invite you to talk about Bellarmine for, for hours and hours and hours, but I, I don't want to lose the opportunity to uh, invite you to say something about uh, your newest book, uh, Seeing with the Heart, A Guide to Navigating Life's Adventures. Um, Kevin, what motivated you to, to write this second book, and uh, how is it different from your first book, and uh, what uh, what would you what would you what would, what would you tell people uh, that they're going to find here? Right. Well, um, the first book, The Ignatian Adventure, is a retreat in daily life. So it's uh, with some narrative in there. This book is all narrative. It's 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 a book that you know um, it's it's it really comes from a class I taught at Georgetown for many years, and now teaching here at Fairfield to undergraduates in the Benson Road campus. Um, and it's really an exploration of, you know, faith and meaning and trying to make the Jesuit tradition of spirituality more broadly accessible. Um, so the language is much broader than in the Ignatian adventure, which is really targeted at sort of people already sort of in the, in the fold. This book could be read by um, anyone who's searching or struggling with their faith it could be read by a devout Catholic or Christian. It could be read by an agnostic or someone who's just curious about the Jesuit tradition or Christianity. It may be a book you might read in your, you know, a, a, a first a first level theology class at Fairfield or wherever. Um, uh, and it it basically takes the it takes the main themes or graces of the exercises and translates them into practices of living. So uh, each each of the eight chapters is based on the practice of living. Give um, us a, give us an example, Kevin. Um, so I guess that the easiest chapter for me to write was a, a, a chapter on living with depth, and and it discusses how it discusses what Jesuits mean by finding God in all things, and I sort of unpack that theologically about developing what's called the sacramental imagination, but. Above all, I give examples from poetry and film and art and literature about how is it that we can find God in all things, not just in churchy things, but in secular things, because the secular and the sacred are really the same reality for for in the Jesuit or frankly, the Catholic tradition or the Catholic imagination. Um, and that was a fun chapter to write because I just was I got to I got to give examples of my life and other people's lives, art, literature, film, my favorite you know, my favorites and just say, this is how you can find it. It's, you know, God's everywhere. We we sometimes limit God. We sometimes think God is playing hide and seek with us, right? Like you got to say the right prayers or <clears throat> look in the right place and maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. And God doesn't play hide and seek. God just lavishes. Um, like he's trying to get our attention all the time. Hopkins has a chilling poem um, where, where he says, uh, these things, these things were there, but the beholder was wanting. It was like, oh my God, yes, these things were always there, but the beholder, the one who beholds, was missing it. You could walk by the same person or thing every day and not miss their beauty. But if we stop and look, we can discover their beauty. So as you can tell by my excitement, I love writing that, that chapter. The hardest chapter for me was um, a chapter called Living in Hope. Um, and because, again, I was writing this full time. I had... I like like the first book. I I'd, I'd sort of written um, on planes and you know at nights over the years of teaching this course, and all my notes were in a file. And but I got I had nine months to actually put it in book form. And Jerry, you were one of the readers who helped me do that. Um, but the one on living with hope was tough because that looks at you know suffering and loss. And so I had to get in touch with my own suffering and loss, and that was deeply personal and human. I. I I had a version that was very philosophical and someone read it and they said, 
this like there's no you in here and so i ripped it up and started again and and i went i went to my own experiences of suffering and loss not in any sort of um i just think i reveal i was revelatory without being overly revelatory but i think one that was trying to be real and uh talked about my own like for instance the loss of both my parents for instance um and that that was the hardest chapter, but I think it might be the best one. Mm -hmm. Jessica, are there any questions that you are compiling for us? We do have a comment and a question. First, someone said, uh, Father, they did read Seeing with the Heart and have used it in RCIA. So kudos oh, to you. <laughs> thank you very much. And then we did have a question from someone about whether or not there's any intention of expanding the idea of the Bellarmine campus. And he mentioned specifically in Florida, he works with communities in Southwest Florida and Central Florida and yeah. is thinking this would be a great opportunity for first generation immigrants. And I know that's we're still only in year one of <laughs> Bellarmine yeah, campus. I know, but, but listen, I, but we I dream and I, I this is. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that that's such a loaded question. <laughs> We're just trying to get this launched, so let me just focus on, on, uh, um, on, on getting this well suited. But you know, there are I, I do I do know the Jesuits. So some of you might be familiar with Krista Ray High Schools. That was a, a innovation begun in 1996 from our traditional um, prep school like Fairfield Prep. Wonderful, and they they continue to serve. But we have not opened up a traditional prep school in in. Uh, since the 70s, we have opened up a number and partnered on a number of these Krista Ray high schools, which are aimed at serving um, those from lower income backgrounds in cities. Uh, and it's an interesting model where students works, work to help support their tuition and their and a wonderful model. You know, now I think this model of Jesuit education at the higher ed level is, is already expanding. BC is going to open up a similar program next year. And I do look at other cities on the East Coast and, you know, um, my hands are full now, but I think in the future, it's like, wow, there are other cities where Jesuits have commitments or where, where or above all, where there are needs that are not being met for particularly Catholic higher education. And so what makes this different than a, a community college is, is probably the size, first of all. But, you know, we have that core, that humanities core. So it's not a technical or vocational school. You know, with along with the philosophy and the theology, the commitment to you know eloquence and writing and verbal communication and and character and development of character and also caring for the spirit with the campus ministry programs and and other things. There's great need along the East Coast, so I, I I'm sure there'll be more on the East Coast. I just don't know whether I I probably will lack all energy to <laughs> to do it. All right, we have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, we had one person come in, she was looking over the website for Bellarmine Campus and you touched briefly on the curriculum, but was curious if there's plans for theology or spiritual direction to be part of the curriculum going forward. Well, the Murphy Center already has, I know there's a number of people from the Murphy Center for Ignatian Spirituality on this on the Zoom call. Uh, we, there already is, the Murphy Center already has a presence and uh, is is making, has has already made spiritual direction available for our students. So. That's already uh, done, and they they take theology that they or they call it religious studies, uh, but they're required to take it in their first year. Yeah, someone else said, and back to your personal spiritual journey, what really tipped the scales for you to join the Jesuits, and what advice can you give to those young adults who are discerning a religious vocation? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me it was, you know, being a lawyer wanting the plan. I just didn't want to let go of my plans. I think it was to sort of throttle back. And I learned, you know, to, I learned to hold the the, the reins more lightly um, and, and letting, you know, on a horse, you know, if you hold, if you hold the reins too tightly on a horse, the horse is going to buck and get off horse. But if you hold the reins just a little more lightly, you'll get where you need to go. And I think I needed to develop, I had to get serious about my own spiritual life. Because I mean, God. I mean, God calls each of us in different ways. And once I was able to sort of let go a bit, um, once I was able to really take my spiritual life seriously enough, I I think that's where I, I I gave God a chance to work on my heart. And that's probably the other important thing is a lot of it was for me in in my head, and I still can do that. The longest distance, as I write in both books, is for me traveling the distance between my head and my heart. 
Mm. And that made all the difference. And so I would say if there's someone on this call or if you have children who are interested, it's really just important to, to talk to someone. Um, yeah, thanks. If there's another, the next question kind of ties into that and you're, the kind of contemplation that you've had to do and really thinking through vocations. And she's asking, what keeps you centered? Is it prayer practice? Is it being moved to contemplation? Mm. Can you talk briefly about that? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so praying that, that, that is critical. I think Jerry can attest, you know, that praying in the mornings for, for me, most Jesuits pray in the mornings that, that day of centering on Jesus saying, okay, what is this about just resting in the Lord, you know, and then, and then my community is important. I live in a Jesuit community and I have very good brothers who are supportive and encouraging. So when we celebrate mass together or, or just a meal together, that that's also very important. Um, friendships outside. I mean, I have deep and lasting friendships from before I was a Jesuit and then, you know, lay colleagues uh, at Georgetown or Santa Clara or now at Fairfield, just it's very important to have a rich social, you know, rich, you know, deep relationships with people who aren't Jesuits. That's been great. And then um, two other very important things, chocolate ice cream, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and golf. I'm a I'm a golfer, and I've committed. At, you know, in my fifties now, and I'm committed to get my game back. So, I find golf really um, uh, it, it recenters me. God in all things. Yes. God in all things, Jessica. <laughs> and we have someone that said her husband's goddaughter attends Bellarmine and is grateful for the rare opportunity. Oh. So, not a question, just a huge thank you for loving her and her classmates. Oh, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then we have another question about, um, because Bellarmine is co-ed, how is the development of young women addressed, role models, mm. et cetera? Yeah, so we are very intentional about making sure that those on the faculty and staff, you know, look like and come from backgrounds like our students. So we, we are a very, very diverse uh, uh, campus. Um, uh, Seventy-five percent of our faculty and staff are, are people of color. Um, uh, Ninety-five percent of our students come from uh, underrepresented backgrounds, so it's a very diverse place. I, I find it one of the most energizing, and you know, because I've always sort of worked in white majority spaces, and this is my first time where I'm not, and it's been really healthy and humanizing and good for me. Um, and those are questions that we really address very uh, honestly. I mean, the country has been involved. Well, you could say, you know, decades of discussion on race and racism, but particularly the last few years since the murder of George Floyd, you know, we've been much more intentional about looking at matters of race and racism and bias and all. And, and we have those conversations, you know, with some regularity, um, sometimes with seriousness, sometimes with great levity. But it's these are important questions to talk about because it's part of who we are as a community and as people. And diversity is an expression of God's creativity. And uh, to pretend like, I mean, it's both an invitation and a, and a challenge for us. Um, so that, that's been enriching for me as a, as a, as a human being. Kevin, the male-female distribution? Uh, it's about 60... It's like it's like the Fencer Road campus. It's 58, 42, mm -hmm. something like that, 55, 45, something like that. Um uh but for women, we have a they they formed with our, our female staff a sister circle. So they mm -hmm. they sort of meet separately from the men. So the men formed men of Bellarmine. So, so we have men upstairs and the women downstairs and What's cool is that faculty and staff can participate in those circles. So there's good men mentoring. I don't know what happens, takes place in the women's circle, but the men's circle, they're talking about, you know, healthy masculinity and vulnerability. It's really wonderful. Right. We have two other questions that I don't know how thoroughly we'll be able to address. Think, let's just take one. Let's just uh, choose one. <laughs> they're, choose one. They're yes. related. They're semi-related, okay. both about the main campus. And the first mm -hmm. one was how for the students that do end up coming from Bellarmine to North Benson, how do we plan to integrate them? Would they be living on campus, roommates, that right. kind of thing? The yep. second about me, the main North Benson campuses, you talked a lot about how mission-driven the Bellarmine campus is, and do we feel that 
we do that same messaging for North Benson or is there room to increase that? So they're similar questions, but different. Yeah. No, I think I think both are works in progress. I think we're I think this is why Bellarmine is challenging us as a university, which is good. I think we're learning how to be a, a, a better university, a better community of learners um, and of colleagues. So both both of those questions are works in progress. We're asking, we're getting. So how do we welcome? How would how do our students feel welcome now? On the Benz Road campus, how will we uh, welcome them? And um, in the in, when they if they come to the four year program, great questions. But we're 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 working through them now. So great. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. What a delight to be with everyone. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk. And thank you, Jerry and Jessica. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank all of you. And I have to say, I mean, I'm probably not supposed to do this, but looking over the uh, the folks who are with us, uh, so many of you have been real supporters. Uh, you've believed in the Bellarmine mission in this project from its very beginnings. And uh, I, I can't I can't lose this opportunity to say thank you to uh, all of those of you who uh, have been part of the movement. Uh, that allowed us to uh, to open Bellarmine and bring Kevin here and to bring uh, to bring uh, a new a new a new and fresh commitment to inclusivity and accessibility. Uh, you've believed in it and you've allowed us to do it. So uh, uh, you know who you are, and uh, others of you who have been great supporters of the Murphy Center and of all of the work that we've done with Ignatian Spirituality, taking good advantage of Kevin's work. Uh, thank you all too. And thank all of you, our friends, our alumni, our benefactors, uh, many, in fact, we have a number of our trustees here too. Uh, thank you all for being part of this larger, uh, this larger Fairfield community. And thank you, Kevin, for being the occasion to draw us together. That's and thank you, you, Jessica. You always work so hard <laughs> behind the scenes to make this happen. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, both of you, Father Jerry, Father O'Brien. Thank you all for being here, for being so supportive of this and so many of our alumni events. We're just grateful to have you here, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.